Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and welcome, everybody. My name is Anne-Marie Ingtov Larsen, and I'm Denmark's tech ambassador, and I'm really excited to be here today. Thank you all for tuning into this special rights concession focusing on protecting digital civic space. Today, I am thrilled to share this virtual stage with some of the most prominent, amazing, knowledgeable people on the earth uh, leading in this debate uh, around how do we make sure that technology actually works for democracy. There is no doubt that technology has many empowering qualities, allowing us to work and socialize across borders and time, allowing it to organize in a different ways and enhancing digital civic space. At the, same, we're, at the same time, we're also seeing how increasingly it threatens potentially both core aspects of democracy and some of our civic freedoms. In today's sessions, we are going to gain new insights on what the challenge is right now, but also the opportunities related to digital civic space. And we'll explore how to protect and promote digital civic space through new and enhanced multi-stakeholder collaboration. The session today is also laying the groundwork for a new Danish initiative focused on ensuring that technology is actively supporting rather than undermining democracy. To start with, I'm honored to welcome uh, Danish Foreign Minister, Mr. Jeppe Kofel, to give a few brief remarks on how he sees this. Mr. Kofel, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, uh, Marie, and uh, good afternoon, and good morning, and good evening to everyone. Uh, I wish to start by thanking uh, Access Now and RightsCon team for organizing another incredible event. RightsCon has continued to grow and has become an enormously important platform for dialogue, and I'm very happy to, to be here and be part of that. Last Saturday, we celebrated the 172nd birthday of the Danish constitution. This makes Denmark one of the oldest democracies in the world. We celebrated our democracy with speeches, with debates, uh, festivity. Um, nevertheless, I am worried for the state of democracy globally. I'm concerned that new technology and the way social media platform functions today uh, are challenging and even undermining uh, democracy. Despite all its benefit, and they have a lot of benefit, the digital revolution has dramatically changed the playing field of uh, democratic governance. Digital tools have increasingly become the weapon of choice against democracy, and private tech companies have gained unprecedented influence over our societies and democratic institutions. I worry that uh, the rise of disinformation will sow distrust of objective media. Uh, it scares me when democratic governments use um, technology to create a surveillance state above and beyond, uh, not democratic, autocratic governments uh, may create a, a surveillance state above and beyond anything uh, Orwell imagined. I'm horrified when I see human rights and fundamental freedoms are under attack online and how the digital space for civil society is shrinking in many places. And I'm worried when foreign actors use social media manipulation to sway elections and undermine both new and more mature democracies. Fortunately, I want to underline this, not everything is bleak. We also have reason to hope. Digital technology holds great potential for strengthening democracy and citizens' engagement. New forms of mass movement and digital mobilization are uh, um, also um, a very important part of democratic values at a global scale. New social movements are flourishing, and especially young people engage in politics in many different ways supported by uh, these digital platforms. For better or worse, the COVID-19 pandemic has been a catalyst for a massive digital leap. We need to support and strengthen this momentum. And Denmark uh, is a long-term and strong supporter and promoter of human rights, democracy, and good governance globally. This is the backbone of our foreign policy, and we are actively engaged in defending human rights using technology and in enhancing the digital resi resilience of civil society. And I'm pleased to see uh, that many of our partners are here today. Uh, we also uh, pursue this policy in international fora. In the Human Rights Council, Denmark is uh, part of a core group 
uh, uh, presenting a resolution on new and emerging digital technologies and human rights and the link between that. But this is uh, not enough. To stand up against the digital threats to democracy, we need to up our game, all of us here in this uh, virtual room. Today, I'm proud to, to launch a new Danish initiative, Tech for De uh, Democracy. With this initiative, we want to kickstart a new multi-stakeholder push to make sure technology supports democracy instead of undermining it. We will bring together governments, civil society, and tech companies around the same table to find new solutions to the dark side of new technology, to force new partnership between responsible tech companies and civil society, and to commit as many as possible to the goal of making sure that new technology works for, not against, uh, democracy and human rights. Because we believe that all differences aside, a critical mass of governments, tech companies and civil society organizations have a joint interest in shaping a responsible, democratic and safe technological future together as part and also equals and also as a strong signal to the tendency of uh, uh, auto, uh, autocratic governments and uh, attacks on our values that we see globally in, in today's world. As part of the initiative, the Danish Minister for Development Cooperation and I will invite high-level representatives from government, civil society and the tech industry to Copenhagen in November to decide how to pursue uh, on this important agenda together. The perfect solution must not stand in the way of, of even smaller progress. In all the concrete areas where we, uh, governments, uh, civil society and tech companies, can't agree to act in partnership, I think we should do it. This is uh, what we want to, to pave the way for in, in Copenhagen in November. Very important debate, full of dilemmas, full of difficult challenges, but something we need to, to show that we can handle uh, together. Uh, we who believe in democracy, uh, in the values uh, that um, that are under pressure globally. So with this, I want to thank you for your attention. I wish you a continued successful RightsCon, and thank you so much for, for all of the engagement uh, that you are giving uh, to this uh, very important topic. Thank you. Thank you so much, Minister Kofo, for a thought-provoking keynote highlighting both the great challenges, but also the great opportunities of this space. And thank you very much for presenting an active engagement on behalf of the, of the Danish government by seeking to tackle these challenges at the intersection of tech, democracy, and human rights. Building on the minister's keynotes, it's evident that there is a lot to be done. If we are to avoid the bleak outlook that he mentioned and focusing on how do we harness digital uh, technologies for all the positive things it can do to digital civic space. The question is, how do we advance that? How do we cooperate? What do we need to do? To answer those questions, I luckily have five amazing people with me here today uh, to help find some of those answers and who are really at the front line, whether it's on the developing side of technologies, on the using side, or where um, activists right now are trying to do a difference. Let me start by introducing them briefly to you all. With me, we have uh, Dr. Joan Donovan. She is the research director of the Shorenstein Center on Media, Politics, and Public Policy at Harvard Kennedy School, where she leads the Technology and Social Change Project, which explores how media manipulation can control public conversation, derail democracy, and disrupt society. Some grand issues to be tackling. With us today, we also have Miranda Sisson, Miranda is the human rights director at Facebook, where she joined in 2019 uh, the company's human rights policy work. Miranda brings uh, 20 plus years of experience in human rights research and policy making. We also have with us Brett Solomon, who is a well-known face to many of you as the founder of RightsCon. He's also the executive director of Access Now and constantly defending and extending the digital rights of users at risk around the world. We also have with us today Jessica Xu. She's the director of policy for Reddit, where she oversees all global government's relations and public policy for the company. In addition to advising on matters of content, product and advertising policy. And finally, we have today with us Nima Aya. She is the founder of Policy, a civic technology company based out of Kampala, Uganda, working on the intersection of data, design and technology tackling subjects such as digital inclusion, 
digital rights and civic technology. Thank you all so much for joining. Let's jump right into getting a bit more perspectives from this panel. Um, Joan, if you don't mind, I'd love to start with you. Um, in your work at the Technology and Social Change Project, you explore how media manipulation can control public conversation. That's really at the heart of our democratic debate. You know, how can this disrupt society, derail democracy, some of the really big issues. Could you help us start by defining what is digital civic space and how do you perceive its current state? Uh, no small questions. Uh, thank you so much and I really appreciate uh, the commentary and the dedication uh, um, of, about um, what Denmark is is planning to do. And I only wish that my my home country here in the U.S. would would think through some of these issues um, more holistically, not just in the policy making space, but also as we think about this grand challenge around our information crisis. And the question of space is often one that we talk about. Uh, related to internet and platforms, of course, a decade ago when we were having a having a very similar conversation about social media in a very different context, uh, there was a lot of talk about how important it was going to be that social media remain open and free and uh, uh, kind of as a technology be allowed to explore and do uh, whatever they saw fit, these uh, you know these companies, because there was uh, a lot of energy around this idea that what happens online has these um, important effects in our public sphere, and not just in our public sphere related to uh, conversations that people are having, but also relationship to actual physical space. If we think back to um, uh, the, even the documentary, The Square, about the Egyptian Revolution and and things that have happened in Tahrir Square. And then, of course, the Occupy movements. There is uh, this this uh, relationship to, in, to spatiality. But I think it's also important for us to realize that uh, there is no public space that doesn't have some kind of uh, security and safety policies and apparatus and protocols in place. Right. I can't just go to the Boston Common and set up a tent and declare myself uh, sovereign and and uh, and take up public space. And and the issue, of course, with online platforms related to public space is very much about uh, what happens on those platforms and how people present themselves and what kind of disruptions, of course, uh disinformation agents or me media manipulators might have on everybody else, right? And so this is the, the fundamental question. And for us, it's really about, as a research team, thinking through these harms, thinking through hate speech and what it looks like to have hate speech at scale, right? Not just a few uh, neo-Nazi groups, but you have militias getting organized on Facebook. And we saw the effects of that in Kenosha over the summer where um, Kyle Rittenhouse uh, killed several people uh, after he had uh, joined uh, a group that had been organizing on Facebook. Um, we also worry a lot about harassment, network harassment specifically aimed at silencing journalists and advocates, right? So it's, it's not the case that it's just a few different letters to the editor that are, uh, you know, way off base. We have, at some points, hundreds of people at a time attacking journalists, uh, trying to get journalists to shut down their accounts, especially journalists that are covering very serious issues like women's health, uh, particularly around uh, abortions. And then the last piece, which I think is also one that uh, resonates across countries, is the degree to which disinformation uh, promotes incitement to violence. And of course, in the United States, on January 6th, we saw this uh, abhorrent and horrible attempt to uh, take over the U.S. government. Um, several people died. There was many, many injuries. Uh, but what's different about January 6th that I think the U.S. really wasn't ready for was they weren't taking inciting rhetoric seriously. So anywhere you looked on any platform that you were looking at related to the hashtag Stop the Steal or uh, any of the the ones related to the election being rigged, 
you would find violent content, very violent content. Uh, and there was a lot of confusion uh, in the moment about what do you do with these kinds of words? What do you do with these calls to action? And so I think there's going to be, at least through the U.S., and, and it will reverberate, of course, throughout the, the rest of the world, a very public reckoning about the the process by which uh, social media um, allows for these kinds of um, serious, uh, I don't want to call them debates because they're not really debates. Um, when people think the election has been rigged and it hasn't, that's different than, uh, you know, just a normal kind of conversation that one person might have with another. In the U.S., we definitely had politicians weighing in in ways that were obviously beneficial to them uh, and com incredibly destructive to our our democracy and our civic conversation. And so uh, those are the kinds of things that I think about when I'm thinking about the relationship between public space. What do we do about it? What do we also do about the digital space? And how do we make it a, a place that has safety and protocols uh, in ways that people understand what is allowed and what's not allowed, and then what the actual repercussions are going to be. Thank you. Thank you so much, Joan. And, and I think that gives a very, thank you for that overview. I think also for giving us a bit of a temperature check on how does it currently look. Miranda, let me go to you. Um, Facebook is a company that has an incredible global impact, not least on politics, society, and democratic debate. Uh, it's very much the center of, of growth, criticism, but equally excitement about the potential. Since you joined Facebook in 2019, you've been heavily involved in developing Facebook human rights policy, a policy that I understand was first released in, here in March this year. Um, now, the huge responsibility of steering Facebook human rights policy lays on your shoulders. Um, and given today's topics, it would be great to hear your thoughts on what action has Facebook taken um, in order to contribute to protecting digital uh, civic actors at risk? And I think some of the, uh, actually some of the examples that Joan just came with, and how do you see, I mean, obviously we've been in a bit of a weird space the last 15 months with the pandemic. How has that influenced that? Thank you very much. Thank you uh, for having me here and Joan for your very insightful comments. Um, I think the first thing that to say is of course is, is um, that I should do is to note that the human rights principles that we've developed over the last 60 years are incredibly important guardrails for these conversations. When we have uh, contests over important public goods and rights are always confusing. They're always got an element of, of uh, integrity or often an, ergo, an element of malicious or perverse behaviour. And so understanding that the rights framework and other frameworks that we have that delineate and define a principled approach to rights in public space is really, really important because civic space isn't just what I or you or Joan or some government defines it is, but we'd have, have certain principles defined globally that we are wise to uphold in common. And the internet is clearly quite apart from the pandemic, entering a new phase, and not all of that is bad but where adversarial actors have far greater expertise than in earlier phases. And simultaneously in the last 15 months, COVID has had extraordinary impact on us all as humans, workers, citizens, and family members. So on a, on a personal level, I and my colleagues actively experiencing the narrowing of civil space daily, as do billions of users around the world. And one of the most important things we can do is obviously to keep services running, to keep the infrastructure functioning. Um, to 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 cope with this huge wave of increased usage that you know it it's it's not a given that everyone can cope with. And although our human rights policy that we put out in March is new, I want to say in the last 15 months, I think we and others who are members of the Global Network Initiative have really been leveraging the fundamental protections and fundamental commitments that we've made to protect global freedom of expression. And um, and the right to privacy, as defined by ICC, ICC as the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, particularly against arbitrary government requests for data and content removals, because those, as ever, are coming in thick and fast, and 
In many ways, as civic space narrows, we see attempts to gain data or to suppress speech to increase, and that's reflected in all indicators. We've also worked very hard to combat COVID-related misinformation and support the, um, the distribution of accurate health information. And I do think there is some very interesting precedent there that helps us think about encouraging uh, work for the future. In our human rights policy, we explicitly recognize the risks faced by human rights defenders, and we explicitly seek to support them. So we've long been doing work in this space, but I guess I'd say that we are codifying it by supporting escalations from human rights defenders through our trusted partner program, combating malicious actors, including state state sponsored actors. And I want to note a very recent overview report we put out, I think about two, two weeks ago, that has an overview of three years of work. And I agree with Joan, this is a field ripe for further work. We seek to protect activists and defenders from incorrect content moderation decisions, as well as expanded access to remedy through the oversight board. And we are offering advanced security options built with nation state adversaries in mind. So we're also creating a new fund to assist human rights defenders in practical terms that will be releasing in Asia Pacific. And I can give you a moment of a snapshot in time, but what I want to say is I think there's everything we have to learn and everything we need to do, but actionable, practical and principled steps can absolutely be taken. Thank you so much, Miranda. And uh, I hope we can dwell a little bit more later on in the discussion into some of the concrete initiatives that have been taken by Facebook and, and hear the rest of the panel. Um, but Brett, I, I want to move to you. You've really been heavily involved in years uh, in fighting for you know, fighting for, defending, extending the digital rights of users at risk around the world. And while tech companies hold a lot of responsibility, and some of it we just heard from, from Miranda, it's said that democracies haven't figured out how to adhere to democratic values and, you know, international human rights framework on their own and use the regulation of tech. So what is, you know, I want to dwell a little bit into what is the role of governments, um, particularly also in mature democracies that are really helping set the frame for this? Uh, you know, what is a realistic and effective approach that you believe governments can and should take around harnessing digital technologies and these platforms for the purpose of strengthening, promoting democracy and civic digital space? I have 15 answers to that question, um, and I'm going to try get, to get through them in two minutes because I think that, um, as you set for us, it's a task. Um, you know, it's absolutely essential, as you say, that governments, whether they be democracies or, or not, that they adhere to and that they um, have in place a range of not just technologies but actually tech policy, and I, I want to focus on that. So here's the list. Um, number one, get the whole population online especially the most marginalised. Like, you can't have a functioning democracy with half the population or more offline. Protect encryption rather than undermine it. Legislate enforceable and robust data protection laws. Make multi-stakeholderism real by consulting with digital civil society. Join the Freedom Online Coalition. Be consistent with your digital policy at home and abroad. Ban facial recognition in public, publicly accessible spaces. I'm halfway through the list and I've got a minute to go. Um, ensure content moderation by companies um, in their jurisdiction is rights respecting. Don't spy on your citizens, nor deploy, nor deploy surveillance infrastructure um, against marginalised populations. Resist moves towards um, so-called digital sovereignty. Stop unlawfully requesting user data from tech companies. Protect the right to freedom of assembly and peaceful protest online. And ensure that the COVID tracing apps, the vaccine passports and other pandemic responses don't harm privacy and freedom of movement in the meantime. Train your judges, your policymakers, and your le legislators in digital rights. And finally, keep it on. So there's a 15 point agenda for your meeting in November. Um, these are the things that I think are absolutely essential for governments to put in place if they are to ensure that technology and technology policy supports and enables democracy rather than undermines it. And I just want to just before I hand over, um, I just want to address what Miranda said as well, because 
I think following on from Joan's point around, you know, civic space and the protection of civic space, that it's not just about governments, obviously. It's about the fact that much of this space is privatised. And, you know, it's essentially the big platforms like Facebook and Twitter and others. Um, and we've seen the consequences of just this global outage that just happened, you know, a few hours ago. Like what happens when private actors, um, what, what are the consequences of private actors' behaviours? Um, and so the best policies in the world are different to the implementation of those policies. And when we see Facebook's um, human rights policy that got put out uh, earlier this year, which is great, it's about how that policy is actually implemented in the real world and what does it look like in Palestine? You know, what does it look like in Colombia? And how does that interface with the governments that they work with, whether they be those democracies or not? So thanks. Excellent, Brett. I want to, in the panel later, we'll go back to policies versus implementation. And uh, I want to also, can you just quickly tell me, super quickly, on those 15 points, say we had this debate three years ago, and now we're having it again today. Are we in a better place today on, you know, making those 15 points achievable, or are we worse? You know, it's, it's difficult to say because there's, you know, there's sort of 15 gradients that are happening, or 15 you know, uh, line items there, and some of them are going forwards and backwards. I think one thing to say is that, um, you know, you win a, you win once, but you don't necessarily maintain the win. So we've seen, like, you know, victories in, in India, for instance, that are being whittled back as we speak on, on, um, on, on content uh, and on censorship. Similarly, you know, the, the, the crypto wars, we've been seeing them for, you know, 20 years now, and sometimes we win and lose on them. So... It's difficult to say in a sort of across the board, but I, I, I do feel as though, um, you know, the, the sort of the conversation that we're having right now is not necessarily, hasn't necessarily progressed in the direction that it needs to. And I say that as the convener of RightsCon. I mean, there's so much discussion and so much debate that is happening, but ultimately what does it mean for a person who's experiencing a shutdown. You know, 55 internet shutdowns happened last year. Um, there's already been 55, uh, 53 internet shutdowns this year. So, like, for the person who's experiencing a shutdown, you know, the conversation hasn't actually evolved to implementation to stop internet shutdowns, even though we've got the best resolutions of the UN. Um, so, um, you know, I can't give you a, a definitive answer because it is so nuanced. But I think that there is a maturation of the space. You know, having 500 companies at RightsCon is a really good indication that there is, in 55 governments, is a sense that we're actually progressing things. Um, but I want to make sure that, you know, the litmus test, in a way, is the marginalised user and what is their experience of being online. And I don't necessarily think it's getting better for them. So I hear a little bit of optimism, but a very, very cautious one. Um, Jessica, I, I want to move over to you. Um, there's a lot of concern about social media platforms being, you know, potential bastions of, you know, dark, anti-democratic conversations, hate speech, whatever you want to call it, um, and where communities whose purpose is, you know, reprehensible, you know, threatening the digital civic space and where they thrive. How have you, have read it, you know, been supporting digital civic space, and how are you creating an environment? that is enabling democratic participation? Yeah, thanks for the question. Um, our approach to this at Reddit looks a little bit different because we're a smaller company, we're a differently structured company in terms of our content moderation, and we're really only just starting to develop a global footprint. Um, but that said, Reddit really lends itself to the organization of civic participation. No one in the U.S., um, especially in the Congress, will ever forget the way that the Reddit community organized a few years ago against the threat of SOPA PIPA, for example, the historically bad copyright legislation, um, where Reddit largely, uh, Reddit users largely um, organized a phone call campaign to um, express their displeasure with um, the impact that such overbroad legislation would have on their ability to speak out and express themselves. Um, and much of the reason why Reddit lends itself to this type of organization is because the structure of our platform is itself democratic. So the unit of engagement on Reddit is fundamentally the community rather than the individual user. And we actually sort content on Reddit primarily by the votes of our users. 
And we also put users at the center of our content moderation efforts. And in fact, more than 99% of all content moderation decisions on Reddit are carried out by the users themselves rather than our centralized corporate entity. And so this participatory nature of Reddit helps build a culture of engagement that carries offline as well. And we've really leaned into that by running civic engagement campaigns that connect voting on Reddit to voting in real life. So for example, during the US presidential elections last year, we put billboards up around the country showing Reddit posts that actually got more votes than political candidates to demonstrate the power of collective community voices if they organize. Um, but of course, as you mentioned, civic participation certainly goes beyond voting. And in particular, when we talk about the digital civic space, preserving Reddit as a place for safe, authentic, community-centered conversation is what we focus on. And so in practice, this often means, um, as was mentioned earlier, defending our communities against state forces in particular that seek to constrict them. And this is especially the case, unfortunately, in countries around the world that we're seeing trend more autocratic in terms of how they seek to police dissent on the web. And because of this, we've made it a point to scrutinize every government takedown request that we get and in this scrutiny, we consider international human rights principles and norms. Um, but secondly, it's really important that we're also transparent about doing this and transparent about sharing our data. So Reddit's API is open to researchers. And in our annual transparency report, we denote, for example, the number and types of requests that we have gotten from every country. And we also note whether we complied or not. So not only is it important for us to defend our community's legitimate rights to digital civic participation, but it's also really important for us to let them know who's being the most active in seeking to control those spaces, their spaces. Um, and so when we talk about other threats you know, to um, uh, online digital civic spaces, there's, the, there's of course the obvious threat that you alluded to, um, Ambassador, which is malicious actors whether they be nefarious government actors seeking to manipulate or mislead online dialogue, or you know, everyday trolls who might have a malicious or even a, a violent agenda and are seeking to use our, our tools to implement that. Um, so on this, you know, the, the system of self-governance that we've actually set up has been highly effective in addressing um, a lot of those concerns with some kind of guidance and safety guardrails put on by our teams that I'll talk about um, a little bit later. But essentially what we try to do on Reddit to marginalize violent or bad voices is to essentially try to ensure that the volume, you know, the volume of certain views on Reddit is proportionate to the number of people who actually hold those views. So loud trolls or people with an agenda that they're trying to push should not be able to hijack an entire community conversation. So we pay a lot of attention to the fundamental health of the community conversation. But to ensure this, while at the same time respecting our users' rights to protecting their privacy, protecting their identity, we focus on identifying suspicious behavioral signals rather than seeking to collect and verify individual users' personal data, which can be really dangerous when you're talking about civic participants, especially in more autocratic states, where if we have the data, we can be compelled to hand it over, and we don't want to do that. Um, now, secondly, I will note that there is, of course, the less obvious threat um, to digital civic space, which is what I will call um, well-intentioned but unsophisticated legislation from generally liberal rights-respecting countries. And in this, I really want to associate myself with everything that Brett just said. Um, there are a lot of laws, both draft and enforce, out there right now that unintentionally constrain the civic space in overbroad efforts to address you know, what are real legitimate harms that need to be addressed. Um, attacks on encryption, rigid 24-hour takedown laws, overbroad copyright regulations. But the unintended consequences of these can sometimes be dire, both within the, jurisdic the jurisdiction itself and through the power of example. 
And, and by power of example, I mean authoritarian countries are modeling their internet restrictions on those of liberal states in this sort of kind of funhouse mirror policy jujitsu that's frankly very hard for companies, especially smaller companies, to push back against. It's hard for us to go up against the power of a state. Um, so to mitigate this, we really need to focus on educating lawmakers about the nuances of how platform governance actually works, because it's usually more complex and diverse in terms of approaches out there in the marketplace than it's realized. And um, then, of course, there's you know the request scrutinization that I mentioned earlier that takes place. But to, to wrap up, and to be honest, there's only so much that companies, and, you know, particularly smaller ones like Reddit can do when we're up against the state, as I mentioned. So what would be really helpful is to have a coalition of democratic countries setting and following norms about human rights and civic participation in the digital space in a way that sets an unequivocal example against authoritarianism. Thank you so much, Jessica. Lots of food for thought, not least on the role of various sizes of platform. And interesting to hear how Reddit has been, been dealing with this. Um, We'll go to Nima now, but I just want to advertise, please ask questions for the panel. We'll get to them uh, after this round of introductions. Um, so you can ask your questions and we'll get it to the panel. Nima, um, you're a founder of a civic technology company, a very active figure in the debate on the advancement and engagement of civil society. Could you give us your view on what is the biggest issue neglected in the debate on protecting digital civic spaces? Yeah, totally. Thanks so much for having me. Um, I think the, the one I'm going to touch upon is one that Brett already discussed, which is on access and connectivity. And there's multiple facets to this. So when, you know, we're thinking about, so I'm coming from the perspective of um, running a company based in Uganda and we work across Africa. So the debate that we have is very, very different. But of course, you know, Africa's population is growing very quickly. And even though technology companies have for a very long time ignored our needs, um, you know, finally, Twitter is considering opening an office in Ghana, like very, you know, slow movements are being made in considering the needs of African users. But um, when you think about it, if a majority of the people are still online, then basically the marginalized people are left behind, the privileged people continue to have more power. And many of the harms that are evident, you know, in our physical lives are replicated online. So first of all, a large proportion of people are offline and they don't have access to the information and they are more susceptible, you know, to some of this misinformation and disinformation that spreads because, for example, fact checking is one of the main tools. And if you're not online, you don't even have access to fact checking, for example, if that's one of the tools you're using. Another big issue is the gender digital divide. So women are less likely to be online. And um, as we've seen many technologies, new technologies, for example, tend to impact vulnerable groups like women um, disproportionately. And then you're thinking about other issues such as, you know, the internet cost is actually really high. And with the pandemic, many people have suffered losses to income. So even more people are falling offline. We have many repressive laws that keep people offline. Like for example, in Uganda, we have the social media tax which um, everyone has to pay a fee every day to access certain over-the-top platforms and many people can't afford that and that has pushed more people offline. And then the other things that we're battling with in terms of access and connectivity, so earlier this year Uganda banned Facebook, um, last week um, headlines were made when Nigeria banned Twitter and is now going to criminalize the use of Twitter. We have many internet shutdowns, so just basically the internet is at threat in like how we can be online. And then the other two issues which are re related to this are digital literacy or media literacy, how you want to take it. And I always want to talk about this topic of digital empathy. So in the African context, many people are coming online for the first time. And when you enter spaces where, you know, there's a lot of negativity and you have more clout when you are negative or when you shoot other people down, um, then that's kind of the behavior that you take on. That's what you think online spaces are supposed to be like. And that's very harmful to constructive civic discussions. So many countries in Africa at a very pivotal time where people are coming online for the first time, um, they're meeting these digital spaces. And I always remember, you know, like 20 years ago, 30 years ago, maybe not that long, but um, you know what a beautiful space it was. And now if you come online for the first time, what a different space it is. And what can we actually do, um, you know, even this initiative that's launching today, what can we do where we bring together governments, educational institutions, media houses, private companies to 
work more on this topic of digital empathy when you enter private spaces. So yes, content moderation and you know blocking and deplatforming, but what about users who are coming online for the first time as well? I think that's a topic that I would I would love to have broader conversations on. So that's my take on it. Thank you so much, Nima. Uh, we covered a lot of ground from, you know, where is the current, you know, where do we see digital civic space all the way down to internet access and shutdowns. We've been getting a few questions already, so we'll we'll do a few rounds here. Um, the first one I want to start with is actually for you, Joan. Um, just very briefly touching on this relationship between policies and implementation. You know, you're researching this on an everyday basis. Very shortly, where do you see the status of you know good policies coming out? How is it going with implementation? Yeah, I, so one of the things that uh, that the field of science studies and kind of brings to the fore is uh, this notion that technology is, uh, uh, is policy made durable, which is to say that often technology arrives in the world. Oof, even years ahead of the policies we're going to need to uh, wrangle them. And so, of course, this is playing out very clearly in the space of AI. We have uh, big debates about facial recognition technologies and what are the appropriate policies, even though the technology is already here, right? And so there's been cl calls for moratoriums against this kind of technology. Uh, and so it's really important to understand that the technology arrives usually much earlier than the guardrails or the policies. And right now with social media, I feel like we're at this point where someone has built, you know, a, a 737 and they're, and they're circling, you know, trying to land it. And we don't have the airports. We don't have the infrastructure in place. We don't have uh, the context in which uh, we would need to, to be able to understand, well, this technology is, is being used by these actors in this way which is totally fine, right? Facebook events where you're uh, organizing your kid's birthday party, totally innocuous use, same exact technology used to uh, plan ride shares to take down the capital, right? And so it's really important that we understand that it isn't just a question of, okay, the technology is introduced, we know what the technology's capacities are, we know, then know what policies to make. Scale intervenes in a very strange way, which is to say that when we have millions or hundreds or thousands or millions of people misusing the technology uh, in ways that the the original designers didn't intend, that's when we need to um, have a conversation about what the policy is and what the implementation is. And And I've been a strong advocate of trying to understand disinformation, not as a content free speech issue, but as an issue of amplification. That is to say, if misinformation is reaching millions, it's actually a different problem and needs a different policy fix than something like, hey, someone is wrong on the internet. Um, and so those are the kinds of things that I think policy wise we have to think through, which is really about the process under which uh, we decide something is a problem and then what policies are going to uh, be useful in terms of the scale of the harm. Thank you, Joan. And picking up on this, and we've been getting quite a, quite a number of questions uh, for the company representatives. Um, and I want to pick up also on what you said, Nima, that is very, you know, internet shutdowns where we're seeing, you know, that the access to these platforms are being, you know, banned or hindering people from actually using them. Miranda, let me start by hearing a little bit about you. You know, there's been questions around, you know, what kind of structural changes or, you know, what kind of policies are you seeing Facebook being putting in in terms of being, you know, not becoming a, a you know, a weapon for malicious governments or, you know, autocratic governments? Um, you know, how are you seeing the opportunity for corporate activists in, uh, in terms of defending digital civic space? Thanks. Um, so. I, um, I could speak for like two hours. And of course, it's not words, but action that's important. So I think the key thing to the fundamental thing is that the majority of Facebook policies and structures are deeply influenced by the membership of Global Network Initiative, which is a multi-stakeholder coalition of, of companies and groups. 
are designed to protect freedom of expression um, and freedom and access to information and protection against arbitrary government takedown. So we we operate those daily, and that's a bedrock that's almost impossible to explain or overvalue, right? And not all companies have that bedrock, right? Not all companies are members of the GNI. So I see there's a fundamental opportunity for companies to make and enact those basic protections where they seek to evaluate government requests against local law and international law and seek to push back by all means possible. Um, I also think that uh, I'd like to uh, revert to um, Brett's notes, the 15 points that he made. Right now, um, the space is very fractured. Um, We are in the midst of a variety of different ways of backlash and recognition um, of the strengths and negatives of of all of the tech uh, tools. Miranda has, oh, you're back with us. You just froze for a second. Please continue, Miranda. While we're waiting for Miranda's internet connection, speaking of keeping it on, Jessica, let me just get a few, you know, a a short remark from you. When we talk corporate activists in in this space, um, and especially around some of the systemic, you know, changes that corporates need to do in this, what do you see as Reddit's, you know, one or two best examples of that? Yeah, well, how you push back really depends on, you know, the nature of the government that you're dealing with. So in established democracies, you can use the court system and we can and do that frequently. But to be honest, in kind of the more authoritarian regimes that are passing stricter um, Internet regulations like Turkey, like Russia, it's really hard because, frankly, the government holds all the cards. And if you don't comply, you know, at the least they can block you, which isn't good for any of your users. Um, They can also arrest people. And so um, what's really troubling is when we see kind of more established democracies copying in a lot of ways that authoritarian playbook. We're seeing, you know, draft laws in in Australia, for example, right now um, that would block um, internet platforms um, after you know two infractions. Um, we're seeing draft laws in the UK that would arrest company directors. Um, and so I really think it's important that global democracies um, set some norms for what's acceptable behavior for um, democracies and rights respecting societies in achieving their you know very legitimate goals of online safety and protection. Brett, where are we in terms of setting those norms globally? Um, again, it depends on uh, depends on the norm. Um, but I I, I want to um, I think there's a few there's a few out of the list the fifteen. And um, there's a couple of that I'd like to sort of and maybe responding to one of the questions in the chat about like where should focus be. I think one of the things that would be very helpful. Um, across the board that would deal with many of the issues that um, the both the tech reps and also um, some of the civil society and academics on the panel have, have mentioned is we we really need robust data protection frameworks nationally within every country because if we get the data piece right, I think we get a lot of the rest of the equation right. Um, and right now we have, you know, um, extraordinary amounts of information that's being collected by the tech sector, major question marks, of course, over the business model and whether it's currently appropriate in the context that we're we're in now in 2021 um, and in this decade. Um, But not just um, data that's being collected by companies, but data that's being collected by governments as well, particularly in the context of all of this health data um, that we've got um, that's being collected, including from, you know, vaccination apps and 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 contact tracing and, and and immunity passports and so on. So I think if we can get that norm right and that norm legislated for, there's going to be significant benefits in terms of holding tech companies accountable um, and also holding governments accountable and ensuring that the citizen actually has further and the user has further control. Um, I think the other issue that's super important and we've seen it play out in countries all across the world from you know Hong Kong to, to to Palestine 
uh, to Myanmar is this issue around the right to peaceful protest. And, and that that issue is um, that right is being undermined significantly in the digital environment and also how then how it plays in the physical environment. And the third one that I want to mention um, relates to facial recognition. Um, and it's it's also obviously a biometric data issue. It's it's in the list of 15, um, but particularly around the use of um, of facial recognition in publicly accessible spaces. And I think if we can get the data protection bit right, the assembly piece right, uh, and the facial recognition piece right, we're in a way being a little prophetic about what this next decade looks like um, and how to make sure that the digital space is actually one that enables democracy, which I think is essentially the, the topic of this panel. Um, just before I hand back, I, I also, I mean, I want to, we want to hear from the rest of what Miranda has to say. Um, but again, I think that it's not just a member of being the GNI, which is the issue. Like, we're seeing this play out in real time now. We've seen it in Myanmar. We've seen it in, in Palestine, which I've mentioned a few times. We've seen it in Colombia. We've seen it in the US. Um, and there needs to be across the board. It's not just within Facebook, but also within Reddit and all of the tech platforms that there needs to be a greater allocation of resources when they're dealing with these issues that are life and death and at scale. And I think that unless we get that commitment from the tech companies, which is not just about writing great documents, but actually resourcing a commitment to human rights protection in the real world or in the offline world, in the world, including the digital space, um, that then democracy has a chance. And if we don't, if we don't see that, um, that commitment from the tech sector, then um, you know we're all gonna we're all gonna lose out. Miranda, where is the? Uh, what does it look like from the tech sector? What do you see as the commitments going forward? Yeah, I can't speak on behalf of all company, but Brett, I think the fundamental thing to understand is that the GNI commitments have a real price tag. We have to staff the huge teams to assess the government requests. We need outside counsel. We fund the human rights impact assessments. We fund the operational procedures to handle these one by one and to assess them and to build infrastructure. They are far from perfect and COVID has taken a huge toll. So we can argue for increased resourcing, but do not for a second, I would not want anyone on this panel to think that these were paper commitments that had no resource tag already or no meaning, okay? So there is a world more to do, but there is real action. Um, I, mean, I, I agree, if I, if I may. I think the, the GNI is a global network initiative for people who are listening not, not aware, which is a, a, a collection of companies that have committed to a set of principles. Absolutely an important and essential body. It's, we watched it since the beginning of RightsCon 10 years ago. But, but again, like, you know, sort of, um, um, assessments that happen with, um, you know, lawyers and um, and assessors uh, in Menlo Park is different to what it means for an activist or a civil society member on the ground who can't access their hashtag on on right. on Insta. You're like that's a, right. th there's a gap there, and I think that we need to close that gap. It's not that to say that we don't need the principles or we need that we don't need the the bodies that are going to monitor it, but we need to have implementation in the ground. And I think we're on the ground, and I think we're past the point now in terms of what we're seeing and the consequences of bad tech from democracy and citizens. That you know, it's time to turn this around. Miranda, a very a very quick answer on. So, where do you see the commitments, particularly on a global scale? Yeah, so I think, first of all, the human rights policy, which is not just about words on paper, but is a codification and a deep dive into different processes that we already have and that we are intending to strengthen. We also commit, by the way, to a global human rights report annually, which I think might be a really great way just of sharing insights and actions, but also beginning to drive the accountability and drive the conversation much quicker and much more publicly to contribute towards closing gaps. But this is not a seamless, easy experience for anyone, right? And some of these gaps that, Brett, you're alluding to are the result of enforcement, right? Enforcement against good policies, enforcement against bad policies, technical failures, all kinds of different things where some of what we need to do is invest in much better and more robust conversations based on data to narrow the problems and drive to change. 
which you know is one reason why that um, we here at Rights Con is to try and contribute the thinking and the participation and activism, and that we hope that our policies relate to action to show, not tell change. And I'll leave it at that. Excellent. I want to go over to you, Nima. I mean, you spoke around some of the challenges that you are facing on a daily basis and how you're working, you know, against them, you know, working, working around or against them. When we talk about building local resilience and when we talk about, you know, using these platforms as a way to uh, advance digital civic space and democracy, what do you see as the main opportunities? And I think for the rest of the panel, what do you see as the role between, you know, academia, civil society and, and tech companies in this? Yeah. So I think one of the main ones, of course, is um, building infrastructure. And I obviously know that that's very expensive and but I think committing to supporting countries to build infrastructure, especially going out into um, rural areas where traditional telecommunication networks do not find it profitable, so they do not build their towers there. I think supporting countries to build this kind of infrastructure, um, supporting them to lower their prices. So in East Africa, for example, I know that Tanzania and Rwanda have really brought down the cost, but that's not the case in Uganda, for example. Um, for one you know, GB of data, it can be up to 40% of your monthly income, which is completely prohibitive to get online. Uh, the other things that can be done are local languages. So localizing content so that people who don't speak English basically can get into online spaces. Another big one that came up was on research that we did, which showed that women who experienced violence online um, disconnected their accounts. So either they closed down their accounts or they stopped using online services. And we've been talking about you know, bringing more people online, but if online spaces are um, toxic, then you're actually driving women away and, you know, all these gains that you've made through infrastructure are lost. Um, then there's a lot of, um, I think people need to come together to build awareness against patriarchal norms, which keep women offline. So even like phone ownership can be a big issue. So that's, you know, that's a bit of a softer area where um, you don't need that much um, investment. Um, coalitions are great to put pressure on governments. Keep it on does such a great job in putting pressure on governments when it comes to internet shutdowns. A lot of people have been very quiet about the shutdowns of um, different platforms, of course, which are private companies. But it would be interesting to see um, other bodies like African Union come forward and also, you know, um, voice what's going on across Africa. And then, of course, there's certain policies and laws that are brought about by companies. One of them, when we did our research called Afrofeminist Data Futures, um, one of the big issues that came up when using online platforms are some of these colonialist vague practices like shadow banning. So, for example, you know, if you want to talk about colonial issues, patriarchal issues, violence against black people, then you might be shadow banned or, you know, your content might be removed. We've seen it with other recent happenings where if you want to discuss issues related to certain contexts, you're not allowed to or your content gets taken out for whatever reason. So I think there's a lot that can be done in terms of um, investment of like, you know, hard cash, but also in terms of bringing together different sectors to work on some of these softer areas of policy, advocacy, awareness building that I think could make a big difference. Amazing. So I feel like uh, the list of 15 points from Brett just got additional list, um, very important points from you, Nima, not least in the infrastructure. Um, one last question, and uh, Joan, I want to go back to you. You talked about we're right now circling in an airplane without an airport to land in, and that speaks to the infrastructure, but a bit more on the policy side. Uh, Brett, you spoke to it too. You know, can you can you make us a bit of up, you know can you give, give us a bit of optimism or or how does it look the next twelve months are we starting to build that infrastructure um, you know what do you see as the outcome here yeah I'm I'm certainly not optimism lady so I apologize for that but um, I actually do you know the reason why I'm in this field the reason why uh, we do the work we do at Shorenstein is because we. We do care deeply about getting a communication system and infrastructure in place that works for the broadest possible uh, group. And so there's just some, some fundamental uh, philosophical shifts that need to happen, which is to say that we need to have a broad understanding that the technology that uh, undergirds our policy and our, our governance structures is, is incredibly important. And it's, uh, at the end of the day, a struggle over po power, right? We, these companies are no longer, you know, 
dorm room operations as in the case of Facebook. It's no longer uh, these ideas that we're out here experimenting with, even something like like Reddit that seems innocuous, right? It's just a website where people type things, right? Uh, you know, um, w why would it end up having such important effects on our elections and on our, our journalism and on our educational systems? And it's because this is where people are coming up with uh, ideas about how they think the world should work and there's a couple of fundamental um, problems, essentially, with the openness of some of these webs, uh, some of these web platforms. And so, I think what we need to understand uh, more than anything at this point is the scale question and how big is a company allowed to get uh, if they cannot protect uh, the conversation as well as protect the civic integrity of information that's being circulated to millions of people at instantaneously. And I think that Thank that's you. something that we need to address. Amazing. Thank you so much. Uh, with uh, great power comes great responsibility. I want to thank you all the participants and I want to particularly uh, thank the uh, today's speakers for showing up and for showing how you are taking on that responsibility and working to defend, promote, expand digital civil rights and digital civic space. It's been an incredibly interesting conversation. I know the debate could go on for a long time. We have lots of questions still coming in. So let's hope this is uh, not an end, but a continuation of the discussion. Um, thank you for your time. Time. To all the ones who've been viewing this with us, thank you so much for tuning in. Uh, we look forward to working with you on this in the future because there is certainly lots to do, and uh, I hope you all have been taking notes. Thank you.